Hi, um, my name is Bianca. Um, thank you so much, Rick, for your um, kind words about stop signs. Thanks to the organizers, to Oak um, as well as for um, the words on the, the, this important campaign that's taking place here in Toronto. Actually, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm yeah. just going to sit down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're on a North, North America-wide tour. Um, and uh, this is actually our second stop. And this book is, um, it's a critique of car-based um, systems, of a, of a transportation system based around the private automobile specifically, and it chronicles our two-month long voyage to the USA. Um, and it's split into three parts. The first part is 17 chapters, and every chapter is a different theme around um, a destructive element of car culture and um, car-dominated society, from landscape, geography, housing, um, to the impacts on health of pollution in a landscape that's dispersed and impossible to walk, um, to, uh, to the impacts on communities, um, individualism, and social movements, as well as the car's role in the unfolding environmental disaster. The second part um, focuses on why. Like, why has the car um, gained the place and the status that it has? Why is it so powerful? Why is it uh, powerful to the point of invisible? Um, and the third part deals with the solutions, or some solutions that, uh, that we thought of, and that already exist, that uh, are being um, put, in, put into place in many places around the world. Um, so we'd always wanted to uh, go on a road trip through the USA. It's, a, it's, exciting, it's an exciting country. There's so much, there are so many amazing cities. Um, we wanted to go on a road trip. We wanted to survey the land of the automobile, the most car-dominated place in the world. Um, but we didn't know how we were going to go about going on a road trip, given that we didn't have a car or a license between the two of us. Um, and so we decided to get a bus pass. And part of the reason why we didn't have a uh, license is because we live in Montreal. We're pretty lucky. Um, we've, I've never needed a car. I can walk everywhere. I don't even use the public transportation that much. I can walk to work. I can walk to school. I can walk to the grocery store. I can borrow a movie. Almost everything I need is within a three block radius. So we were spoiled and somewhat naive, I think, when we took, this, took, uh, took up the challenge, um, which was to see whether we could get across the USA to go from top to bottom, side to side, um, without uh, the use of a private automobile. We wanted to see if we could do it. Can we get across the USA without a car? Um, we were also really cold. Uh, Montreal has a great great transportation system and it's really walkable but it's really cold, terrible weather um, and so like good Quebecers we headed straight for Florida. Um, and you know part of what we deal with in the book is the idea of freedom, sort of open up with that because cars are so heavily associated with freedom. I mean like the freedom of the open road, um, just freedom, it's everywhere and so we ask ourselves is this true? Um, well. It's sort of true if you're living in a car-based society where um, you need a car to get around, yes, for sure, then it's fair to associate cars with freedom um, in that kind of a landscape. But as non-drivers um, in Florida, uh, it was clearly not the case. I mean, we had been warned. Uh, my friend who lives down there, uh, we used to live in Montreal, you know, we talked on the phone just before I left, and she said it's different here. Um, you know, I, I feel a real sense of you know confinement. I feel as though I've lost I've lost some of my freedom, which I couldn't quite wrap my head around. Partially because I was just so cold, and it was Florida, <laughs> and she was living you know in Davie, which is 20 minutes from Miami, and I wondered how it could be anything other than fabulous. Um, and we were basically defeated immediately. Um, immediately upon our arrival in Fort Lauderdale. We're trying to get to Davie, which was um, where she was staying. And we got there in the evening and public transportation was already finished for the day. Um, and so we were like, can we walk there? And people were like, absolutely not. That's crazy. You'd rather camp out here. So after some hemming and hawing, we gave up and caught a cab, uh, which is one of the first things we did in the US and spent $40 you know, that we didn't really have. Um, to get to her place, and the next day we were defeated again. Um, we took a we took a bus into the commercial area in Davie, and then tried to walk back 
and I mean the sidewalks were more like they were they were more nature trails I would say than sidewalks <laughs> and the place was flat as a pancake gorgeous weather and there was nobody walking on the streets except for us there weren't even cyclists and people looked at us from their cars like we were crazy um, it was a really alienating strange deeply strange experience um, for us as travelers um, so back to the question of freedom, um, the brilliant philosopher Ronald Reagan once said that cars are the last great freedom. And this is a popular sentiment, but like, like I said, this, this was not our experience. Our experience was one of isolation, alienation, separation, um, you know, as non-drivers. But, you know, what about people who do drive? Um, you know, if you're not a driver, especially if you're a kid, if you're elderly, I mean, one of the most traumatizing things in a car-based society for, um, for old folks is to have their driver's licenses taken away. You know, as a child, you can pretty much only play with kids that your parents know because you have to be chauffeured back and forth to school, what have you. It's a real loss of freedom. And then for people, for instance, um, folks who are disabled, I mean, often it's not possible to drive a car at all. Um, so, anyway. Now, now drivers um, and the question of freedom. And even for drivers, I think there's a huge question mark. Um, huge question mark. And the first question mark is around resources. It's a massive commitment to own an automobile. Um, the amount of, I mean, leave aside the amount of time it takes to just deal with your car. Um, you know, parking, you know, insurance, blah, 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 blah. There's money, right? Just paying to drive, and the average cost of owning a vehicle um, is $8,400. And for someone like myself or Eve who walk, like, walks pretty much everywhere, um, that would be literally an additional $8,400 that we would have to earn, like we'd have to work for that. And I find, I find that sort of outrageous, that to be able to get from one place to another, that is something that I would have to work and pay for. And it's so expensive to own a car that, um, on average, uh, people who do own cars spend um, January to April 1st, January 1st to April 1st, working to pay for their car. Um, and April 1st has been dubbed Auto, Auto Freedom Day. Um, and it's only after April 1st that we start earning money for the other necessities of life. Um, and I mean, what all this money means is more, is more work. Right? More work. And on average, um, and Canada is actually the second most car dependent place in the world. 80% of Canadians drive to work, and in the US it's 90%. Um, it means more work, and that means less time for other things. Less time for leisure, less time to see your family, um, and less time for civic engagement as well. Um, and that's significant. Um, so, Again, the hardest hit people in a place where um, one has to have a car in order to get around, in order to go to work, in order to see your friends, are people that don't have very much money. So people who work in class, people, poor people. Um, and for somebody who is earning less than $15,000, around $15,000, fully 40% of their income is going, on average, to, to paying for transportation, to paying for their cars. Um, so, in terms of class, um, the history of the automobile um, speaks to the class-based nature of, of driving and of the car. Historically, when cars um, sort of came on the scene at the dawn of the, uh, the 20th century, they were playthings of the wealthy. They were not practical. There weren't roads. They didn't go very fast. Um, and they seemed to be an answer, like a way of reasserting a sort of cultural dominance because there was you know, trains were, you know, trains had arisen, it was the trolley, and all of a sudden all the classes were mixing, and it was very uncomfortable, and cars seemed to provide a way, a way out. And it, at first it was literally, it was quite symbolic because they were impractical. Um, and I think that um, there is something about the car that um, lends, it's a system of human dissociation. I, I mean, even the ways that we behave in cars, the, the mildest mannered, people I know turn into completely different people behind the, the, the wheel of a car. It's incredible. I've never seen a case of pedestrian rage, but uh, road rage is everywhere and it's accepted um, behavior. 
Um, and still today, the car is um, certainly a measure of status. Um, one of the first bi billboards that I noticed when we were on South Beach, we finally made it from Davie to Miami. We were on a South Beach Boulevard, and um, there was a massive billboard that said, um, describe yourself in one car or less. And it made me think of, um, <laughs> it made me think of high school, actually. 10th grade and the 10th grade boys who were bored, and they decided to undertake a rigorous cataloging of the, the, the girls in the class, um, their hotness. And the measure that was used to sort of assign a hotness <laughs> status was vehicles. Um, and the highest possible compliment, I still remember this, was Jaguar. It was like an SJ6, blah, blah, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of like the, the gendered ways in which um, like the status and the car come together, it's not all fun and games for guys at all. Um, the very first time I watched <laughs> Pimp My Ride, I don't know if anyone's seen that show. It's, uh, it's an MTV show hosted by Exhibit. And uh, the, uh, the first show that I watched, I was utterly, utterly mesmerized um, as a guy called Antoine's car, like a ramshackle jalopy, um, had, it was a $900 car and had $20,000 pumped into it. So it got like rims, suede racing seats, um, stereo system, DVD player on steering wheel, a fish tank and a fish tank. Um, and by the end of the show, it was actually, it was very emotional. Antoine broke down in tears and, um, and said, uh, and I quote, um, ladies, here I come. I'm not gonna be the butt of jokes anymore. I'm finally gonna get respect for what I have. You know, so funny but also, Kind of sad, um, and I, I don't know if people are familiar with the TLC song Scrubs, but it really made me think of that, right? Like a scrub who's a guy that you really want to have nothing to do with. Is it, like the hallmark of a scrub is that he's seen hanging up the passenger side of his best friend's ride. Um, so I mean, moving from the uh, sort of class-based nature um, in which sort of the divide between the rich and the poor is exacerbated by the automobile, um, you know, it's not just having to pay more, it's not just a status thing and a cultural thing, it's, it's also just physical space um, and the infrastructure that's required for automobility um, that has further widened the gap between the rich and the poor. And, uh, most specifically, nobody wants a highway running through their neighborhood. Nobody wants one. Um, they're awful things. They're noisy. They're dirty. It's dangerous to cross. Um, they stink. They, the, the amount of pollution that comes out of them. And as a result, um, the decision of where to place a highway is an incredibly political decision. Uh, and highways are often placed in, in the neighborhoods where there is the least political power, the least um, ability to resist those, um, the imposition of those, um, of those structures. And, uh, you know, the most marginalized communities, and in the U.S. specifically, um, this was often black neighborhoods. And one of the second places that we visited was uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And we went to Sweet Auburn, which is Martin Luther King's um, neighborhood, uh, where he grew up, and it was a thriving black neighborhood um, you know, produced lots of civil rights leadership, um, I was really devastated by a highway that was built through uh, Sweet Auburn, cutting it in half, splitting the, the community in two, um, you know, uh, dangerous, noisy, smelly, property values went down, nobody wanted to live there, people moved away, um, it was an eyesore, it, it devastated the, the community of Sweet Auburn. Um, and this is something that is not an anomaly at all. It happened in dozens and dozens of black, black neighborhoods, African American neighborhoods in the USA, in Nashville, in LA, in the Bronx, in Austin, all over the US. And um, you know, it's not, it's not to the same extent um, that it is uh, in Canada, but you know, similar things definitely take place here in terms of marginalized neighborhoods being wrecked by highways in Vancouver where there isn't, there isn't a very large black population at all. The one black neighborhood that you know existed 
had a highway built through it. And also the only highway, um, because Vancouver was so thorough and so good at fighting off um, highways. Um, and the same thing we've seen in Montreal with communities of color. Um, Chinatown has been quite devastated and um, divided uh, by, by highways. Um, so, I mean, in con contrary to the idea of um, like liberation, freedom afforded by the automobile, this, um, I mean, I think there's huge question marks on this. Um, and what's worse is a lot of the things that I'm describing are also, like also make um, cities infertile grounds for the social movements that are required to tip the scale back um, uh, between the rich and the poor. And, um, you know, Eve will go into that a little bit more. Um, and I guess, uh, I guess I'll leave it at that. <laughs>